close to either, but shouldn't we? But do we have to? Um, not good, Bryce. Okay? Me and Amanda are not good. It's not good. Is it your fault? No, it was her fault. She made me text her co-worker. Yeah. And of course it's my fault, bro. I'm an asshole. Well, at least we're at work. And money. Work. The work and money. Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. We're pathetic, aren't we? Oh, my God, dude. Somebody shoot us. Directed by Mark Milad and starring Anya Taylor-Joy, Ralph Fiennes, and Nicholas Holt, the menu tells the story of a group of wealthy elites and one stowaway and their fateful visit to an ultra-exclusive dining establishment on a secluded island. This restaurant is the passion project of the brilliant and eccentric Chef Slowick, played by Fiennes, who along with his exceptionally devoted kitchen staff, has created a dining experience of the utmost precision and decadence, which he calls simply the menu. Every aspect of the menu is painstakingly crafted. No detail is considered too trivial to avoid careful attention. The story centers on Margot and her well-to-do date, Tyler. Tyler is obsessed with Sloak's work, and this evening represents the culmination of a long-held dream to meet the man he so admires. Margot, however, is clearly less than enthusiastic about this world of extreme decadence. In an early scene, she and Tyler are offered a snack, oyster in a... Menanity? Min... Mignonet? A raw local oyster and a mignon that emulsion. That, that, whatever that is. Tyler is blown away, but Margot insists that she would have preferred if the oyster had simply been served plain. After they are seated, Sloat gives a speech preparing his guests for the evening ahead and requests only one thing. Do not eat. Taste, he says, indicating the mindfulness he desires from his guests. Savor, enjoy, but please don't eat. At this point, you might assume that the film is going to limit itself to mocking the unhinged epicureanism of a certain class of people who simply have too much money to spend it in any less ridiculous manner. But as the chef's antics progress from eccentric to threatening, it becomes apparent that tonight is no ordinary night for this establishment, and that the menu for these guests will stray very far from the culinary delights that they had expected. Ironically, in a film that mocks concept-driven dining, the biggest problem is that the menu itself is mostly driven by its concept. Luckily, it's a strong concept, which is why the film spends hardly any time hiding the ball. Within the first 20 or 30 minutes, Sloak explicitly states that before the night is through, everyone will die, and this much could have been guessed based on the marketing alone. And past this point, the film could have become your standard torture porn affair, but the days of Saw and Hostel are well and truly past, and thank God for that. Instead, the menu provides a more thoughtful experience, and it's a film that has some genuinely interesting things to say if you give it a little room to breathe. Chef Slowick is a man who has reached his breaking point. Having started as a humble fast food cook in a low-end burger joint, he has worked his way up through the restaurant world, eventually reaching a level where his clientele consists of only the uber-rich. But at this price point, food, even the best tasting food, is no longer enough. What is desired is an exclusive experience and a sense of spectacle that nourishes not the bodies, but the egos of his status-flaunting guests. Over the years, this decadence has begun to wear on Sloak, and even worse, his wealthy benefactor has begun to demand that he compromise on what little is left of his vision. Each of the guests present in some way represents this world of wealth, celebrity, and spectacle, and tonight, Sloak will avenge himself on this world. The one guest who defies this classification is the woman who calls herself Margot. Early on, we find that she is a last-minute substitution for another woman that was originally going to be Tyler's date. This sudden alteration of Sloak's meticulously planned evening prompts him to confront Margot in an effort to find out enough about her to determine where she is situated in the conflict which he is planning to stage on this evening. I need to know how to seat you, he says, with those who give or with those who take. There's a clear dimension of class conflict, but these classes are not so simple as rich versus poor. After all, it's very unlikely that Sloak is poor in any real sense other than by comparison to his patrons. But there's a catch. Whatever side of this conflict Margot ends up on, she will still die. Everyone has to die tonight. But that's our culture, isn't it? And my restaurant is part of the problem. I'm certain that everyone has heard the word decadent before, probably with positive connotations. Come try our decadent chocolate fudge sundae, that, that kind of thing. In this sense, the word means luxuriously self-indulgent. But before it was used to describe desserts that never live up to their promises, it was meant to describe a state of moral or cultural decline and corruption. It is this decadence that makes up the subject of the menu. 
Slowik's restaurant represents the absolute height of this decadent culture, where food itself has been corrupted. Now, among these patrons, it is appreciated for the pleasure it can provide to the senses, and even worse, the exclusivity that results from its price, rather than its nutritional life-giving properties. One thing that sets the menu apart is its refusal to go for the cheap shots. Through a series of conversations with Slowik, it's revealed that Margot is actually an escort, and has, as a matter of pure chance, served one of Slowik's other guests, an elderly married man, and he had disturbed her. One imagines that what will come next is some grotesque story like those told by Sarah in Leaving Las Vegas, but what is described is both less grotesque and more disturbing. He had requested that Margot pretend to be his daughter and watch him masturbate while telling him that she loved him and that he was a good man and a good father. Yikes. Another movie might have leaned into this perverse story, but Sloak interrupts her to joke, so he was a romantic, and then explains that he doesn't need to hear the details. The point is not to tantalize the audience, the point is the brokenness and psychological compartmentalization of this man who can still hold his head high around his wife when he's in the presence of someone who has seen him do this. This same circumspection is shown in the handling of the social themes. This is not some eat the rich revenge fantasy, even though it does occasionally devolve into that. Instead, the critique is more sophisticated and more damning. This is not a movie about class conflict, really. It's about caste conflict, and that is a very different thing. Slowik's diners are wealthy, for sure, but that's not the real issue. I think you'd have to be a little bit naive to believe that Slowik himself isn't pretty well off, and the same should be said about the people who made this movie. The Hollywood crowd has some pretty deep pockets, and I don't even need to look up the numbers to tell you that this cast does not come cheap. These people are not going to cast themselves as the villains in one of their cultural products. The more significant fact about Slowik's guests is that they are elites. Now, in recent years, this word has become politically charged, but before that, just about everybody interested in sociology used it and recognized its validity. If you'd like to know more about this, I highly recommend researching Edward Bernays, the nephew of Sigmund Freud, who pioneered the field of public relations, which is essentially the use of mass media to affect popular opinion. Institutions are the guiding hand behind any society, and elites are those who sit at the top of those institutions. However, this does not mean that they are some Illuminati-esque cabal of string-pulling masterminds. They are simply another demographic group. Obviously, they are not monolithic, and they have various internal conflicts and differences of opinion, but on the whole, they are largely responsible for the shape that society takes. They are the leaders and vision makers responsible for producing the motivating ideals that serve as a lodestar for the rest of society. When the vision produced by elites is a good one, society functions pretty harmoniously, each demographic more or less satisfied with their role in this vision, and each individual more or less content with the life that is available to him by it. The menu explores what happens when the vision of the elites and the cultural institutions that they have crafted become defunct. The elites in this room are not somehow the main elites or anything like that, they are simply members of this cast, and not particularly high-ranking ones either. Leguizama's character is something of a relative loser in this world, a has-been, but he's still a member of this class, even if a low-ranking one. In the chicken taco scene, Slowik provides his guests with soft tacos, and on these tacos he has also provided evidence of their corruption. The tech bros have their hands in the financial cookie jar, the older man has been having affairs with prostitutes that resemble his daughter, the food critic has abused her power and destroyed people's dreams to satisfy her vanity, and Leguizamo's crime is that he claims to be an artist, but he produces trash like Dr. Sunday, which is presumed to represent all the various consumerist slop produced by Hollywood in any given year. The point that Slowik is making here is not that his guests are bad people, it's that they are unworthy. They are dissolute and their vision is corrupt, hollow, and self-serving. This is contrasted with the extreme devotion to their craft shown by Slowik and his chefs. The crime that Slowik wishes to avenge is that these elites have polluted and destroyed the purity of his dream. This theme of corruption and brokenness is echoed in the scene in which Slowik introduces one of the dishes, the mess. The name is meant to refer to the mess that so many of them have made of their lives through their efforts to climb the ladder of the status hierarchy. The dish is the creation of the young sous chef Jeremy, who has ruined himself in following in the footsteps of Slowik, and has realized the ultimate hollowness of that goal. But it is too late to go back, and Jeremy ends his life in front of the guests, some of whom are so deeply submerged in hyper-reality that they believe they are only watching an act. Others realize the danger and attempt to escape, but their attempts are so lacking that they do not even rise to the level of physically attacking their captors. When one suggests that they take their steak knives and make a break for it, the other responds, you think we have better knife skills than them? And like that, the idea is dropped. The outcome is uncertain, and being hurt is likely, so why bother? In 2003, Aaron Ralston was canyoneering in the Utah desert when a boulder fell on his arm, trapping him. After 127 hours of waiting, Ralston realized that he was not going to be rescued, and he amputated his own arm with a dull multi-tool after breaking it himself. The story became an iconic example of the triumph of the human spirit, the willingness to embrace life at any cost. 
But Slowik's guests certainly don't share this fierce instinct for survival. Even Slowik himself later comments on how weak their efforts are. And in the end, this is sort of the point. As the evening's festivities are nearing their end, the guests have already largely accepted their fates. It seems that the reason that they have tried so little to escape is because they too despise what they have become. The movie transcends the usual class complaints by showing its awareness of all the party's mutual complicity. Whatever this system is, it has grown beyond the control of its creators. It is something less, but also more than human. This defunct collection of elites is contrasted with Slowik and his chefs, who demonstrates the nature of a true elite, even if he seems insane to outsiders. Though his realm is very small, he is so loved by his chefs that they are willing to die for him. His vision is profound, powerful, and motivating. But he cannot extend it past this little island, and the most significant act that he can achieve is to force this small sampling of the elites that rule over him to recognize their own inadequacies. Do not eat, Slowik instructs his guests before they have begun their first course. Taste, savor, relish. Consider every morsel you place inside your mouth. Be mindful, but do not eat. Our menu is too precious for that. What is the value of food? Obviously, the question has two answers, but they are not equal. Food tastes good. It's a great source of pleasure, or at least it can be, but its far more important function is that it nourishes us. It sustains our lives. For those on the bottom rungs of society, food's value is its use value. And as Slowik explains in one of his speeches, bread has throughout history been the food of the poor, sustaining them through the ages. When Slowik provides his guests with a plate of condiments, but on which the most substantial component, the bread, is missing, he is illustrating the hollowness that has corrupted his business as a chef. This commodity market in which he operates has resulted in an absurdity, an inversion of the rightful hierarchy of values. The corrupt and the decadent taste, relish, and savor. The innocent eat. Of all the guests, Tyler is the most pathetic because he is so in love with this degraded thing that he is willing to die for it. Throughout the entire movie, Tyler's reactions have become more and more insane for precisely the reason that they are so trivial. When Margot returns from the conversation in which Slowik informs her that everyone is going to die, Tyler throws a tantrum because he believes that she has been treated to a more exclusive experience than him. Did offer you a kitchen course? What was it? Protein or veg? Protein or veg. Even when it has become obvious that Slowik plans to kill everybody, Tyler is apparently unbothered. Finally, it is revealed that to Tyler and Tyler alone, Slowik had revealed the plan and let him know that he would die if he attended the dinner. Not only did Tyler attend, but he brought along a guest whom he knew would be sacrificed. Tyler's dream is to be embraced by Slowik as another chef. Throughout the night, he has been commenting on the various aspects of the dishes and revealing that he's not totally ignorant of what the craft involves. Do you make that with a Paco jet? Exactly right, sir. Yes. Slowik eventually humors him, providing Tyler with a chef's uniform and inviting him to create his own dish. It would seem like a golden opportunity. Tyler has access to presumably the best ingredients and tools that anyone could ever ask for, but he reveals his lack of talent in a spectacular fashion, creating a nearly unedible dish. The scene reveals the vast chasm between the dilettante and the experienced craftsman. As with any form of activity that has a high skill ceiling, and few things have a higher one than the preparation of food, there is a near infinite amount of information that cannot be expressed or learned through writing or in fact any other medium aside from experience and the long costly lessons of failure. After Tyler's failure, Slowik whispers something in his ear and though we hear nothing, we can guess that its effect was to inform Tyler that he would never be one of them and that all of his efforts to memorize the trivia of their craft have not equipped him to join their ranks. But there's more to it than just that. During the scene in which Slowik shows the guests their crimes, the tortillas that are provided to Tyler show him snapping photographs of the dishes in direct contravention of Slowik's commands. Tyler's problem is that he is trivial. What sets Slowik and his chefs apart is their competence, but even more importantly, their discipline. By failing to follow this simple command, Tyler has shown that he is not worthy because he cannot be led. He is obsessed with the products of Slowik's genius, but he cannot understand their substance, only their commodity value. He cannot see beyond the surface of things. Devastated, Tyler hangs himself. Of the guests, he is the first to die because he is the most committed to the decadent culture which has to be sacrificed tonight. Despite the fact that at the beginning of the film, Tyler seemed to be, in certain ways, above the other guests, able to laugh at their pettiness, he is the most pitiable of all of them. The rest of them eventually make their peace with what's in store, and by the end it's uncertain if they even want to keep living. In one particularly touching scene, Slowik actually charges them for the meal, and each of them produces a credit card. There's no reason to do this. In fact, refusal to pay might even produce a little chaos that might in turn give an opportunity for one last chance at escape, but none of the guests care about that now. 
In fact, though it might seem incredibly petty on Slowik's part, this is actually a disguised moment of generosity. As they pay, this act, which has become so mundane for each of them, is once again imbued with some significance. They have been relieved of their status, and they are now able to relate to each other simply, one human to another. Pointless as it is, this is the last act of generosity or affection that any of them will ever be able to show to another person, and for that reason it is profound, as all choices become profound against the backdrop of mortality. Only the woman who calls herself Margot, the odd duck out, makes any real and consistent efforts to get away. Through these efforts and the indulgence of Sloic, she learns that he got his start as a short order chef for a cheap burger spot. In his quarters, she finds a newspaper clipping in which a very young Sloic is shown smiling for the camera and flipping a burger. The photograph represents the now corrupted idealism of Sloic's younger self, whose delight was in being able to unite the two values of food through his craft, nourishment and pleasure. Margot is able to use this knowledge to make her escape, complaining that Sloic's menu hasn't done the one thing that it ought to do, sate her hunger. She asks for a cheeseburger, knowing the emotional resonance that this will have for Sloic, and Sloic is happy to oblige. She then asks for a to-go box, and he provides this as well. I've heard some people comment that this is nonsensical and bad writing, others have suggested that Margot has somehow hacked Sloic's psychology, and this is a trick that she's playing on him. Neither of these are correct. Sloic releases Margot because she has, in his eyes, established her innocence. She is not part of this psychodrama, and belongs on neither side. The distinction may seem meaningless to her, but it is of the utmost importance to Sloic because he is participating in a different moral order than she is. Sloic then, in what is easily my favorite scene, introduces the final course, a s'more dessert. The s'more, the most offensive assault on the human palate ever contrived. Unethically sourced chocolate and gelatinized sugar water imprisoned by industrial grade graham cracker. It's everything wrong with us, and yet we associate it with innocence, with childhood, with mom and dad. But what transforms this fucking monstrosity is fire, the purifying flame. It nourishes us, warms us, reinvents us, forges, and destroys us. As each of the guests is draped in a chocolate cap and a frock of marshmallows, they seem to be ready for whatever comes next. The room is splashed with gasoline and Sloic takes a couple of hot coals in his hands, and as he prepares to drop them, igniting the room, we see one of the guests mouthing, thank you. Thank you. Sloic drops the coals and fire engulfs them all. Meanwhile, not Margot boards a small boat and manages to get it started. She pulls a safe distance away from the island and looks back to see the restaurant exploding in the distance. As the fire roars, she pulls the burger from its bag and takes a bite, taking one last look at Sloic's menu before using it as a napkin to wipe her mouth. Proving by her carelessness, her lack of consideration for the drama that she has just witnessed, or those who participated in it, that she is ready to move on. In the collapse of the old order, the future belongs to those who are able to engage with the world simply and vigorously. Not those who taste, but those who still remember how to eat. <laughs>